Hello and welcome to Short Talks from the Hill, a science and research podcast from the University of Arkansas. I'm Bob Whitby, a science writer at the university. This month, we're checking back in with Professor of Physics Paul Thibodeau to get an update on his research into harvesting energy from freestanding graphene. Welcome, Paul. Uh, hello, thanks for having me. Great to have you back. So the last time we spoke with you was a couple of years ago when you were developing a theory on how energy could be captured from graphene. Before we find out what's new, can you give us a refresher on exactly what is graphene? Yeah, yeah, good. So graphene is a single layer of carbon atoms and the uh, atoms are arranged in a honeycomb lattice structure, the, car the carbon atoms. And uh, so it looks a lot like chicken wire actually. And uh, you can get uh, graphene from graphite. So if you, if you take graphite, which is basically coal and you kind of peel it and it's very flaky and you thin it down, uh, eventually you'll get down to one atomic plane of graphite and that is graphene. Okay. And why is that of interest to science? Well, that's a big question. Uh, you know, that goes way back. So long ago, there, it was predicted that if you thin something too thin, it would become um, unstable and would tear apart or melt, actually. That being three-dimensional was keeping it together. So it was kind of, uh, from a fundamental perspective, it was very interesting in 2004 when graphene was first isolated. But for our research, what's very interesting is we take this single layer of graphene and we put it over a picture frame so that it's freestanding in the middle of the frame. And it has very unique uh, properties because it's this sheet of atoms that never existed before. I mean, we have three dimensional solids and we also have gas, a gas of atoms or a fluid of atoms, but never before have we had a sheet of atoms. And the, the, what's, what we found is that's very interesting, just like the atoms in the, in the room are all moving around all the time because they're at room temperature. Well, this sheet, kind of like a sheet of, uh, on a clothesline is waving around all the time as well because it's so thin and so flexible. And that's, the, that's what's been very interesting for us to study. So this motion is, when, you're, you're, when we spoke earlier, this motion is what you thought could be harvested for energy. And now you've successfully developed a circuit, is that correct? Yeah, so we spent, it's been three years in the, in the making here. We had the idea three years ago and it took us three years to get to this point. But, um, Basically, yeah, so um, we had to develop this uh, energy harvesting circuit. Uh, and the way we did that was uh, taking advantage of a property called a varying capacitance. So basically we bring a sharp metal probe close to the graphene surface. And as the graphene is waving around all on its own, just because it's at room temperature, it causes the distance between this metal probe and the graphene to also vary. And when we apply a bias voltage between the two, what that does is it causes the charge on the graphene to increase when it comes closer to the metal probe and decrease when it goes away from the metal probe. So we naturally form this alternating current and we can use that alternating current um, to power a circuit. Okay. And you had the idea before, but now you've actually built the circuit. Can you, can you tell us, I know it's hard to explain something like that in a podcast, but can you give us an idea how it actually works? Yeah. So what we did to, to make it really prove that it could be something useful, I think, uh, is we connected the metal probe to uh, diodes. And so diodes, these are gates essentially that allow current to flow only in one direction. So when the, when the graphene is moving toward the metal probe and the, the current starts to, you know, the charge on the graphene starts to increase by current flowing in the circuit and it'll go in one particular direction. And we isolate the, the, the flow of current using a diode when it goes, let's say clockwise. 
And then when the graphene flips away, the current will flow counterclockwise, but because of the diodes, it's forced to go through a different path through the circuit. So we can tell when the graphene is moving toward or moving away because of the way the current flows through these diodes. And I should point out the, the, the big thing there that we've discovered was it was predicted in the 50s that if you had this type of what we call Brownian motion, this kind of thermal motion of the graphene, that for one, it couldn't cause, uh, couldn't be used to power a circuit. That, that was one thing. But in particular, if we connected it to diodes, the diodes would, would squash or reduce the amount of current flowing in the circuit uh, just by their inherent uh, property of being acting like a gate. And it turned out that that theory that was done in the 50s was completely wrong. And that, uh, that really they didn't have the theoretical tools in the 50s to analyze those nonlinear properties of the gate. And so uh, those have just been recently developed really in the late 1990s. And so when we, uh, when we revisited that problem with the proper theoretical development, uh, we found that the signal didn't get squashed, but in fact got enhanced, enhanced by a factor of 10 or 100 or 1,000, depending upon how much, how, how, how big the fluctuations were. So that was a really big surprise and a pleasant surprise for us too, that uh, not only could we power the circuit, but in fact, the nonlinear nature of the diodes enhances that power significantly. So you sort of rewrote the book a little bit on, on <laughs> physics. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. That that was a that was a big um, that was a big paper that was out there in the '50s. And Feynman, uh, who has a famous lecture series that he did in the '60s, basically talks about that in his famous Brownian ratchet lecture series. And um, so, yeah, so that's a that was a bit a bit shocking and surprising, I think, for us, and uh, got us got the paper that we published a lot of attention. A little bit. Uh, what what will this lead to? I think you mentioned earlier it could result in a battery replacement. Tell us about that. Yeah. So s since the theoretical development was taking a long time, but we had the experimental data which showed it worked. So we felt confident from an experimental perspective. So we started moving forward in what we call miniaturizing this energy harvesting technology. So the very first experiments were done in a, in a chamber, an a ultra high vacuum chamber that measures about 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet. What we wanted to do was reproduce what was the essential components of that experiment on a silicon wafer that was processed using kind of standard uh, silicon processing technology that goes into making computer chips. And so so we've been working on that actually for the last, well, almost the whole three years, really. And we've made a lot of progress there. And, and in fact, in, in, in developing that technology, I would say we came up with two, two designs that we're moving forward. One's kind of like a maybe a first generation design, which should produce power and be like a battery replacement, but it'll be for really low power applications. And then the second generation design, which we'll be working on, kind of working on in parallel, but it's going to take longer. Uh, we're hoping we'll boost that power uh, output to to a higher level. And and you'll have something that could power actually power a device. Yeah. So we we're testing the circuit right now um, with really low power. You know, like a watch like a standard watch that has a second hand moving around on it. You know, this typically uses like a microwatt of power. And so what we would like to demonstrate is that this, these chips can power this watch. And, but they're, but it's the power source is the thermal environment. It's not a battery, you know, it's, it's actually just harvesting energy from the motion, you know, of the, of the, of the carbon atoms you know, as a result of being at room temperature. So it would be, it would never need replacing and it would produce power indefinitely? Yeah, I mean, it, it was base, basically made from the same things like resistors and capacitors and computer chips are made of. And those, you know, will last, you know, 20, 
50 years, you know, uh, in, in, in a harsh environments. So yeah, that's, that's the hope. Um, you know, it, it won't produce a lot of power, but we think that we can have it, you know, it's kind of like solar power, I guess, you know, in the sense that you know, can harvest this energy, maybe you could store that energy and use it later, for example, you know, we're kind of, we kind of think of it, we, we, we look a lot at like solar power and wind power, you know, those kind of, you can harvest energy from solar power and wind power indefinitely. So this is kind of the same idea. Mm -hmm. um, in both of those, you know, people do ask me, oh, is this like a perpetual motion machine? You know, they'll run forever. Well, you know, the, uh, no, it's not. Um, you know, solar power and wind power are not perpetual motion machines in the sense that if, you, if the sun goes away, then your solar power goes away and your wind power goes away. And the same thing with this thermal power. So it's not, it's not a perpetual motion machine. It's just taking advantage of all this extra heat that's uh, sitting around because of the sun heating the earth. Still seems kind of a, like a, uh, like a, a, a really significant discovery. What's, what's been the reaction since you published the paper? Yeah, well, it, there's been a huge uh, reaction, actually. Uh, I would say most of it's been really positive. I mean, we've, we've had, um, you know, a lot of, you know, news stories picked up um, the press release that the university did, and a lot of scientists have read the article uh, that we wrote. And uh, I've been contacted by, you know, a whole bunch of people from, the, from enthusiasts to experts and, um, you know, I think that it's going to give us a kind of a clear understanding of, you know, some physics that uh, people knew about years ago, kind of like Johnson noise or Nyquist noise, but, um, you know, going to put that on a more solid foundation with our latest understanding of this theory that was really put together in initial phases in the 1990s called stochastic thermodynamics. Which, which allows us to understand these statistical fluctuations and how they relate to thermodynamic properties. Well, it's fascinating research, and maybe by the next time we check in with you in a couple of years, you'll, you'll have another exciting development to report. I, I hope so. Music for Short Talks from the Hill was written and performed by local musician Ben Harris. For more information and additional podcasts, visit Arkansas Research. That's arkansasresearch.uark.edu, the home of science and research news at the University of Arkansas.